good morning to you all. I'd like to welcome you to the worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our great God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost on this uh, day and first Sunday in April. If you would take your announcement sheet, please pay attention to this so that you may know uh, what is uh, transpiring this week and this particular day. Today is a good day. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper this day. There is a helps sheet that you will need during the supper. And as you are preparing, it would be good to look on one side and maybe consider these things so that you will be prepared to partake. Also, there is a fellowship meal after Sunday school today. You're all welcome to stay, plenty of food, please do so. Please note also there is a church work day assigned on Saturday, May 4th to clean and update and just take care of the grounds and so forth and let us get us ready for a little bit of a spring cleaning. <coughs> Pastor Irick continues to be on his sabbatical and uh, our prayer is that he will be using this time wisely so that he might be of a benefit to us and to himself when he returns. We have continuing with us the Reverend Davis Morgan to uh, bring us the word in the morning. This evening, come back at six o'clock where uh, Lysen Stuart Ireland will be bringing us the word this evening. So now take your time to prepare yourself for worship. Let me also greet those who are watching us online. I know there's a difficulty to the west of us with the wind and the power. We hope that all is well. morning. Great to be with you again. If you'll please stand as we have a call to worship this morning from Psalm 105. Psalm 105 is our call to worship this morning and will lead us into singing our first hymn together. Psalm 105, hear the word of our God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to his name, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he has made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our first hymn, hymn number 248 in your hymnals. And we're going to sing verse 1, verse 4, and verse 5 of all creatures of our God and King. La da 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 la da 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 la da 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 All creatures of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Alleluia, Alleluia Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, 
together now. Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit, we do lift up our hearts, our lives, our minds, everything that we have, Lord, to you, to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory that you alone are worthy of. Lord, for from you and through you and to you are all things to you be glory forever and ever. And that includes us, Lord, every minute detail of our lives. We thank you, we praise you for how you have sustained us, how you have brought us into this place on this Lord's day. We thank you for the beautiful creation that we get to behold and marvel at. And Lord, it pales in comparison with your eternal, infinite beauty. We thank you that you have revealed these things to us, God. We thank you that you have brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus it is because of your glorious resurrection, your conquering, your victory over, over the grave, over sin, over Satan, the powers that we feel hold, uh, hold our world in captivity. Lord, you hold these things. You are sovereign over these things. You reign and you rule uh, over all things. And we, your people, are simply your ambassadors. Lord, those that you have sent into the world to be salt, to be light, to testify to the goodness and to the grace of our God and King. We thank you for all of this, Lord, and we now call upon your name, asking that you would visit this place, that you would minister to us through your word and through your sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Lord, that we might be built up in the most holy faith, that we might be conformed a little bit more into your image here today. And we ask this, Lord, praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The next part in our service is a time of reflection. It's meant to help us to be introspective of our own hearts before God, our own lives before God, and the fact that uh, we can be honest. We can be honest with Him. We can be honest with ourselves. We can be honest with one, one another that we struggle still to this day with sin, uh, even though we are new creatures in Christ, the old nature, the old man still uh, clings or attempts at least to cling to our hearts and our minds uh, to pollute us with sin. And so this is such a sacred, a precious time for us as God's people to come together and to confess our sins. God's word directs us. It directs us to the standard, reminding us of the perfection that our God is and the holiness that he is. And our call to confession comes from Matthew chapter 5, the opening passage of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes that Jesus uh, shared with his disciples. And here is the word of the Lord from Matthew 5. 
And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand so that it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together now. I'll lead us, and during this prayer, we'll have a few moments of silence to confess our sins. Our Father in heaven, we do come to you. Lord, uh, we do thank you for the kingdom, the kingdom that you have uh, created, that you have prepared that you have ordained from before the foundation of the world. Lord, what a wonder it is that you would include us in that kingdom. And Jesus, we're reminded here in Matthew 5 of the ethics, the practice, the mindset, uh, Lord, of those who are in your kingdom. Lord, that uh, your kingdom is contrary. Lord, it is counterintuitive to the kingdoms of this world. Something that we'll hear more about today from your word, and Lord, um, we come, we come now to you to confess, to confess that, Lord, we have not always lived as faithful and devoted citizens of your kingdom. It is so easy for us, Lord, to forget who we are, to forget our identity in Christ, and to simply react, to react to the situations around us, the people around us, Lord, the difficult uh, difficult conversations and spots that we find ourselves in and to react simply from our flesh our fallen nature and so lord we uh, we humbly come before you now and ask that you would hear our prayers of confession that you might be merciful to us lord uh, as we have received mercy we uh, we ask that we would demonstrate that own mercy towards others and that we would never take that for granted god that you are merciful to us, that you forgive our sins and you remember them no more. And so we pray that you would do that now as we silently confess. Our Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for the time that you give us. We thank you that, uh, Lord, that you are a God of uh, mercy, a God of forgiveness, a God of grace, a God of salvation, and that we can turn to you in our time of need. And we pray, Lord, that uh, through the rest of this service and as we go forth from here, you would continue to, Lord, do the hard uh, heart work in, in each one of us, renovating our hearts renewing them, writing your law upon them, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that would be the mindset, the mentality, the focus, uh, the mode of operation for us as your people, uh, the kingdom ethics uh, that you give us to live as new creatures, as salt and light in this world. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Hear these words of comfort and promise uh, from Romans chapter 8, that marvelous chapter in Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Romans 8, verse 1 and following. Here's what the apostle writes. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. We're going to sing in response. All hail the power of Jesus' name, hymn three, or yes, 374 in your hymnals. And we're going to sing verses 1 through 4. Please stand and let's sing together now. Da, 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 da. All hail the power of Jesus, name that angels prostrate fall. Jesus, we do come in your name uh, to the heavenly throne now, Lord. Lord, there's much to give thanks and give praise to you for. So many things this week that have happened in our lives that, Lord, we, if we're honest, we do not, uh, we do not deserve for these things to happen. Uh, and yet uh, we are beneficiaries, Lord. We are recipients of of the good things that you give us. Lord, as we, as we prayed uh, in our prayer of invocation, asking you for our daily bread, asking you to forgive our sins daily as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, these things are so easy to, to take for granted and uh, Lord, forgive us when we do so. Help us to have, uh, Lord, a divine perspective, eternal perspective on everything in our lives and that we that would cause us to give thanks to give praise to you lord we uh we also must ask uh for your help in our time of need asking that you would please bless your people comfort your people 
Minister, Lord, be at work among your people here at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Those who are suffering, Lord, those who are hurting and in pain, Lord, those who are filled with sorrow from this past week. Lord, they have received just horrible news perhaps this week about their health, Lord, about family members, about friends, Lord, about uh, a situation at work perhaps, uh, Lord, uh, news from around our country and world, Lord, there is much to be anxious about, there is much to be uh, sorrowful about, and so we ask that uh, your comforting grace, your mighty hand would, uh, would minister to your people here this morning. We ask that you would do the things that uh, only you can do, which is work in, uh, in the inner parts of our hearts, our, our spirits, Lord. We pray that for those who are struggling spiritually, those who are uh, tired and weary, those who are, uh, Lord, struggling with doubt, with fear uh, over, over their faith, or, Lord, about uh, particular sins in their life, we pray that... Uh, God, you would be at work and that you would uh, speak tenderly to your people here today, that you would minister uh, by your, the truth of your word, the grace and truth of your word, Lord, the power, the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we, Lord, each and every one of us in this place would know, uh, would be reminded our hearts recalibrated, recalibrated, uh, reset to the truth of your word and the power of your spirit to work in your people. Lord, we know that uh, your spirit has the power, Lord, to raise the dead, uh, to, re to raise those who are dead spiritually. And we pray that, Holy Spirit, you might be generous. You might be generous. You might be liberal with your power and uh, the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus uh, to your people here from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, and that uh, your spirit is also the one who sanctifies, who grows, who matures, who builds up your people. So we pray that uh, as the word is preached today and as the sacrament is given and we feast upon the, the body and blood of our Lord, being reminded of the spiritual, spiritual preciousness of that gift, uh, that Holy Spirit, you would please uh, use these ordinary means to do uh, just extravagant Extra, extraordinary things in the lives of your people here today. God, we also pray for your church at large, the kingdom of God on earth visible in your church. We pray that, uh, Lord, you might, you might weed out, you might weed out, uh, Lord, those who are false converts, those who are false teachers, that your church would be purified, that it might be strengthened. Uh, Lord, that it's the light that the church is in this world would grow brighter and brighter. We know that uh, the darkness cannot overcome the light, cannot put the light out, and uh, let, us, uh, let us take great comfort in that. Uh, as, uh, Lord, it's easy, it's easy to uh, feel otherwise uh, throughout the week as we, as we look around, as we see things happening in our world. But let your truth, uh, let your, your word of truth um, take root and grow and bear fruit in the lives of your people here, that our light might shine brighter and that your church uh, might testify to the marvelous, the wondrous works of Jesus Christ uh, where, where you would have us. And lastly, Father, we pray, we pray for uh, the return of our Lord. Lord, we know that our redemption draws near. Jesus, you said in uh, Luke 21 that when we see, uh, when we see the, uh, the chaos of the world, uh, around us, uh, when we see wars, when we see famine, when we see conflict, and Lord, we see just horrific suffering in the world, we know that our redemption draws near, and so help your people to be prayerful and watchful. Lord, help us uh, to stay alert and to be ready, uh, not to be uh, lethargic with spiritual things, not to be uh, haphazard or indifferent, but Lord, to, to stand fast and to pray, pray for the, the return of our King, uh, and to pray for those who are not your people yet to become your people, uh, and that every single one that you have chosen from before the foundation of the world would come into your kingdom, and that we would be witnesses to these things in, in our generation, Lord. 
We thank you that uh, you have given us your word, you've given us your spirit, Jesus, not to leave us alone, not to leave us just abandoned and, and trying to figure this out on our own, but we have your word and we have your spirit and we thank you for them all. In your most holy name, amen. Amen. We're now going to have our offering, uh, an opportunity to respond, to respond to all that God has given to us, giving God what is rightly his, our tithes, our uh, the 10% uh, set aside uh, to, for the kingdom of God and his work, and then our offerings, those that, the, uh, the gifts that we give beyond uh, simply our tithes, uh, our sacrificial giving as a testimony to our love and our devotion to our Lord. And so uh, as they're coming forward, uh, reflect upon that and uh, give, uh, prepare your hearts, prepare your hearts for the preaching of God's word and the giving of the sacrament. Let's pray and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for uh, the generosity of your people. Lord, a reflection upon your generosity, your giving nature, your gracious nature uh, towards us. We pray that you would bless uh, the giving, the tithes, the offerings of your people here. Lord, uh, use it to continue to build up the ministry here at Covenant Presbyterian and also, Lord, uh, beyond these doors, we pray that you would use it to further your kingdom and solidify your kingdom in this city, in our state, and around the world. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As they're bringing the offering forward, let's stand and we're going to give praise by singing the fourth stanza of Come Thou Almighty King. It's in your bulletin, hymn number 212 in your hymnals. Please stand and we'll sing this together. invite you to turn your Bibles now as we come to God's means of grace. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36. Continuing our survey throughout the book of Acts, and we come to Acts 15, verse 36 and following. The title of the sermon is, How God Grows His Church. And we'll see from an early testimony here uh, from the uh, 40s and 50s of the first century here what God was doing at work in his church. Through his, apostle, through his apostles, particularly Paul, uh, through his early church minister, or, uh, missionaries, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, and so forth. So draw your attention to the reading and the preaching 
of God's holy, His inspired word for us. Acts 15, starting in verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Pergia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by uh, Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia who was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Verse 11, So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to uh, Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God. Thanks be to him. Let's pray together now, asking for his blessing upon the preaching and the hearing of his word. Lord God, we do thank you for this time, this privilege uh, to hear your word preached, hear your word proclaimed. Lord, we pray that it would be uh, transformational for us. Lord, that it would be encouraging to us, comforting to us. Lord, that it would also be convicting to us. Um, God, we ask that uh, you would do the work, the work in our hearts of receiving this word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so we ask that, uh, God, you would help us, help us to hear and hear rightly. We also pray for our little theologians, our covenant children who will be listening as well. We pray that you would uh, bless them in their hearing of the word, that you would give them understanding of these things. Holy Spirit, we need your illuminating power. We know that these are spiritual things, Lord, that we cannot... We cannot understand them naturally, but supernaturally, you give us wisdom and understanding. Uh, And so we pray that you'd help us to uh, rightly fear you, Lord, rightly understand you, know you, that, uh, God, we might rightly understand ourselves, that we might rightly understand our world um, and everything that that you have made for your glory. We pray this, we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I have a question for you here this morning to start off our time together. And the question is this. How do you explain it? How do you explain it? How do you explain its presence today? Its presence almost seems like a nuisance. With many people driving past 
church on their way to more important Sunday activities like brunch, 18 holes on a golf course, soccer games, the list goes on and on. How do you explain it? How do you explain its history? Its history. It's history that's filled with schism, scandal, and assault from within, within with those once claiming to be devoted followers rising up against it, declaring war, seeking to lead others astray, those that engage in shameful and sinful behavior that at one time had universally been condemned? How do you explain its presence today, even though the message, the message of the church is taken for granted? So much so that many, that many who claim its identity attempt to change the focus and make the message more appealing by meeting modern man where he is. And as a result, many of those who claim to be part of its tradition resemble more Fortune 500 executives than the original model of a humble shepherd. What about its morality and teaching? Irrelevant and outdated in our day and age products of primitive thinking and ancient traditions that have no place in the modern world. And yet, the church's message, the church's teachings, the church's ethics, what Paul called the pillar and buttress of the truth, it continues to burn brightly in a world covered in darkness. How do you explain it? How do you explain the existence, the continual expansion of the church in the year 2024, the year of our Lord 2024? How do you explain that? Well, the answer to that question is found in the overarching theme of our passage this morning, highlighted in verse 5 of chapter 16, where Luke records for us, verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. This is what we're going to be focusing in on this morning. The growth of the church and how God in particular grows the church. Now, little theologians, kids, what I'd like for you to draw this morning, I'd like you to draw a picture of a tree. A tree that the stages of growth of that tree, kids, from seed to to a big, full tree, an expansion of a tree. This is the image that Jesus gives in the Gospels to describe the growth of the church. And here's the question, kids. It's the question for all of us here today. How does God grow his church? How does God grow his church? Now, I'll give you a hint too, kids. There are four different ways that we see in our passage of God using the means that God uses to grow his church. So be listening to those four ways that God grows his church. Now, here's the outline for our sermon today. I'm going to give the answer right off the bat uh, of how God grows his church. Four principles that we see in our passage. The first one is God grows his church through difficulties. Through difficulties. The second one is God grows his church through discipleship. The one anothering of believers. Third, God grows his church through his sovereign direction. And then lastly, he grows his church through direct means, through direct means. Through difficulties, through discipleship, through sovereign direction, and through direct means. Now first, let's look at the difficulty. The difficulty that will arise following the great account of the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is Acts chapter 15. And we come to it right on the heels of that. The, the, the uh, council was commissioned. It was, it was gathered. Uh, the the uh, elders, the leaders of the church gathered in Jerusalem. They were called. They all came together to basically get on the same page for what now they were having more and more Gentiles come into the faith. And they wanted to know, how do we, how do we square uh, the Gentile faith, the Gentile believers coming into the church with our Jewish heritage? How do we do that? Uh, and so they came together to discuss that. Uh, and the question, of course, was do, they, do Gentiles need to become Jews in order to become members of the church, to become Christians? And of course, they concluded that no, they do not need to become Jews. 
They do not need to essentially observe the law, become law keepers in order to become believers. Uh, but they are united. They are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, as the apostles say, say, just as we are. And so it is the grace of our Lord. It is the work of Jesus that makes someone a believer. And then in light of that, the new identity that, that we have as believers is we have the ability now. We have the capacity for God's law. We have the, the love, the devotion, the delight in God's law. This is how they concluded the Jerusalem Council. And now Paul and Barnabas are going to take that message back to the churches that they first founded, that they founded a few chapters before this. So Paul and Barnabas remained some time in Antioch, preaching and teaching the word of the Lord. We see that in our passage. And that, make note of that, this was central for the early church. Whether they are preaching to those outside or preaching to those inside, the ministry of the word is central to the apostles' ministry, to the, uh, the longevity, the vitality of the church. And then, verse 36, we see how visitation was also part of that ministry. Paul says in verse 36, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. This is the word from which we get our word elder from or overseer. It's to visit, it's to be concerned for, to take care, uh, to take care of or to look after someone. And this is what motivates Paul and Barnabas to start the second missionary journey. What will become Paul's uh, second missionary journey, Barnabas as well, but of course we're going to see that they split here in just a minute. Up until this point, though, Barnabas had been his partner in ministry, and you'll remember that Barnabas was, he was right there in Acts chapter 9, right after Saul of Tarsus had been converted. And he testified to the apostles, he testified to the church on Saul's behalf. Because up until that point, as we said, as we said a few weeks back, Saul of Tarsus, he was a zealot. He was a, he was a re, uh, religious fanatic. He was a religious terrorist. He was not only seeking to arrest Christians, but as he says elsewhere in his epistles, he was actually voting. He was voting for their execution as well. And so Barnabas had been crucial to Paul's early ministry, uh, that he had testified. He had, given, he had given witness that Saul of Tarsus had become Saul the believing, Saul the proclaimer of Jesus as Messiah. And up until this point, they had had great success. Great success with churches planted in Lystra and Derbe. The reception of the Gentiles in, the, in Antioch of Pisidia. We read that passage a few weeks back. And now they're about to head out again. And they're going to share the incredible display of unity. Of unity that the church had at the Jerusalem Council. Everything, everything is setting up according to plan, right? Well, not so fast. Verse 39, look at verse 39. It says, A sharp disagreement arose between Paul and Barnabas over the inclusion of John Mark in their plans. Barnabas wants to take John Mark with, him, with them, but Paul doesn't. Now, why is that? Well, that is because Mark had abandoned them when the trip had gotten difficult. Back in chapter 13, verse 13. And it wasn't, simply, it wasn't simply that John Mark decided to turn around. No, he had abandoned them. He had deserted them, which Paul, Paul viewed as unacceptable. Unacceptable, and thereby it disqualified him from tagging along on the second trip. And the word there in uh, the original language for sharp disagreement, it conveys that both of them were adamant in their views. Neither was willing to budge in this. They were unwilling to change their minds. Barnabas thinks that John Mark deserves a second chance. Paul thinks otherwise. So there is a conflict here. There's a conflict that we see in the early church, a relational conflict that seems uh, impossible to resolve. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? A conflict in a relationship, a close relationship. We can imagine uh, how close Paul and Barnabas were. As, as, as I mentioned, Barnabas had been there with Paul from the very beginning of his conversion. And so a close relationship. Perhaps you are right in the thick of a conflict right now. How are you feeling in that conflict? 
Or in the past, how did you feel when you were in conflict with somebody? Hopeless? Hopeless? You're not alone in that. We've all been there. Because here's what I want you to understand, is that conflict, conflict is a fact of life this side of glory. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful and we don't view that conflict through a biblical lens, we'll allow that conflict to consume us, consume us to where we begin to, we begin to define our lives, see the lens that we view life through and we view our faith through cynicism and fear. And here's what I want you to know about that. When that happens, you can be sure of this, that you're no longer living by faith. You're no longer living by faith. Because what that fear, what that conflict will do is that it will create a kink in the hose, so to speak. Spiritual blockage in your heart that's preventing you from living by faith even in the midst of conflict. And that's where the rubber meets the road, is it not? Who am I when the heat is turned up and I'm faced? I'm faced with responding by faith or by fear. Responding in faith or reacting by fear. You see, that's, that's the choice. And conflict is one, of those, is one of those hard providences that God brings into our lives to test you and I, to grow you and I, to exercise our faith or to fall back in fear, to fall back in fear. And that makes all the difference, all the difference, having a redemptive view, a redemptive view of conflict. Do you have that? A redemptive view that God is at work. A redemptive view of conflict is believing and living, believing that God is at work, even when it seems like there's no way he can possibly be at work in this. You know, there's a wonderful book that I read when I was in seminary. And back in, when I was in Texas, I did uh, youth ministry as well. And part of our youth ministry is that we had a discipleship program where we had a, a reading plan from 6th grade all the way to 12th grade. And the idea was that uh, the, our covenant kids and their families, they would read uh, 20 books during that time period. Uh, and that we would get together on Wednesday nights to discuss it. And one of the crucial books that, our, that I had uh, our high schoolers read and that we would discuss with them was the book by Tim Lane and Paul Tripp called Relationships. Relationships, a, a, a uh, mess worth making. That's what the, uh, the subtitle of the book's called. It is such a profound book. Uh, and it's profound because you rarely hear, you rarely hear a redemptive view of conflict, whether it's preached from the pulpit or just talked about in churches. Because usually what we think we have to do in church when conflict, if there's conflict between us and somebody else in the church or in our marriage, our families, whatever it is, we have to play the part. And so we put on the mask and we act like everything's okay. And we refuse, we don't want to deal with the conflict. It's uncomfortable for us because, you know, God might stretch us a little bit. So we put on the mask and we pretend. You know what, that, you know what that's called in, in, uh, historically in, ancient, in the ancient world? They called those people who wore masks hypocrites. They were actors playing the part. And so in church, it's so easy for us to put on the mask and act like everything's okay. We dress nice. We keep, you know, keep up with the Joneses and we don't actually deal with when conflict or difficulties arise in our relationships. And here's what Tim Lane and Paul Tripp say in their book about it. Quote, conflict with others. Listen, conflict with others is one of God's mysterious counterintuitive ways of rescuing us from ourselves. Did you get that? It's one of God's mysterious counterintuitive ways of rescuing us, not from the people that we have conflict with, but with self. Self. God uses it to get us where he wants to take us because we don't usually think that trials can be used in such a positive way. This truth, they say, catches us by surprise, but it shouldn't. But it shouldn't. Wow. Wow. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that it's snap of the fingers and we just say, well, you know, God works all things together for good or, you know, everything happens for a reason or, you know, when the doors close, God will open a window. You know, all those cliches that sometimes we hear people say. No, 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 no. It's rolling up your sleeves and getting messy, getting dirty. That's what conflict is. 
And what God wants us to understand is that he wants to use you and I right in the thick of that. Right in the thick of that. He grows us by growing us. He grows us by growing us through the process. Through the process. And through that, we learn more about ourselves. We learn more about our hearts that we, we never understood. You know, Proverbs talks about that uh, a man of understanding, it takes a man of understanding to draw out someone's heart. It's like trying to, to get water deep, deep in the well. That's what Proverbs uh, chapter 23 talks about. It talks about. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not, we're not talking about on the surface. We're talking about deep within those things, those those, uh, safe, you know, those rescuing devices that we cling to when, when the heat is turned up and we turn to this or we turn to that or we put up some kind of blockade so that people can't know us. That is not God's will. It's not his plan for when we face conflict. He wants to reveal the complexities of our heart and he wants to, he wants to bring to light those tendencies that are the things that usually keep us from deeper intimacy with him. Do you understand that? The defensiveness, the contempt, the anger, the stonewalling, the completely shutting down, the ignoring the conflict and hoping it goes away. All of those things, all of those things are akin to the check engine light in your car. When the check engine light is on, do you, maybe you do. I mean, I've, I've been guilty of this. You just keep driving and hope that the light's going to go off eventually, right? But that's not why they put that light in the car. They put that on so that you know something's wrong with the engine. You need to get this addressed right away. And in a similar way with us, with conflict, our hearts, those, those, those uh, clutch things that, that, we, that we turn to, those rescuing devices when, when we don't want to deal with something, those are like the check engine light of our hearts, telling us something's awry here that we need to address. If you don't address it, it's going to lead to something worse down the road. So many times we approach conflict this way, don't we? Too afraid of what we might find out about ourselves. And we miss out. We're missing out on God's opportunity actually to grow us, to sanctify us, to mature us. We miss out getting to see God's work firsthand in our lives. In something that, again, the world, the world has no answers to when there's relational conflict. You know, the, the divorce rate in our, in our country has never been higher than what it is right now. Conflict in families between parents and children. And yet God wants to work in that redemptively. And this is what we see play out in the conflict between Paul and Barnabas. What's important to note is that they didn't allow the conflict to derail their plans. They agree to disagree and they go their separate ways. John Mark with Barnabas and Paul takes Silas with him. One team becomes two. And as we'll see, God uses that. He uses that to raise up new leaders. Look at verses 1 through 5. This is the second way that God grows his church, by raising up new leaders through discipleship. Through discipleship. In verse 1, Paul com comes to Lystra and Derby, and the ESV doesn't translate uh, this word because it makes for awkward English for us. But here's where the original language helps by calling our attention to something significant. Something significant of Paul's arrival. It says this, And behold, behold, a disciple was there named Timothy. Timothy. Timothy, of course, becomes one of Paul's most trusted co-laborers. Co -laborers. He will become to Paul an apprentice, a son in the faith. Uh, and about ten years later, after this, uh, he'll receive the last two letters that Paul wrote before he was martyred. Eventually, Timothy will become the pastor or the elder, uh, the minister, to the church in Ephesus. And besides 1 and 2 Timothy, he's mentioned eight other places in Paul's letter. And that tells us, that tells us how much this young man meant to the apostle. And it all starts here in Acts 16, when Paul returns before he sets out on his second missionary journey. Now, what does, what does Luke tell us about Timothy here? He tells us that his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. His father was a Gentile. Later in 2 Timothy, Paul will say, we learn more about the biography of Timothy. Because uh, there he will say that even though Timothy's father was a Gentile, he was raised in the scriptures uh, from both his mother and his grandmother's influence. Both of them were believers in Messiah Jesus. 
And that as a family, as a family, they were possibly converted. They were possibly converted uh, on Paul's missionary journey through their city back in chapter 14. Because they're going back to where they were. They could have heard Paul's preaching. They could have witnessed the angry mob stoning him there in chapter 14. Luke also tells us up at this point, though, however, Timothy was well spoken of. He was well spoken of by, his, by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. This means that he had developed, he had a good reputation among the churches. And that integrity was, uh, was whole. His integrity was whole, no doubt due to the influence of his mother and grandmother. Luke then makes the curious note in verse 3. That upon Timothy journey, or joining Paul for his missionary journey, he went and had Timothy circumcised. Now, this detail is intentionally included by Luke. Why? It's intentionally included given what had just happened in chapter 15 with the Jerusalem council. And there they were, they were uh, debating the question, uh, do you need to be circumcised in order to be saved? That was one of the issues that was raised at the Jerusalem council. And the council ruled there that no, no, there is no must do this in order to be saved. Since all are saved by the grace of God. That's what they said. So then, why does Paul have Timothy circumcised? Paul has him circumcised. It's not salvific. It's not relating to his salvation. But it's for evangelistic purposes. That's why Paul has Timothy circumcised. And he does that so there will be no stumbling block to their group speaking in the synagogues. Because again, they're going to go to the synagogues first, speak to the Jews, and then the Gentiles who are there as well. So it's, it's evangelistic. Uh, it's evangelistically for why he's doing this. And it says that even in verse 3. Verse 3, it says, Because of the Jews in those places, for they all knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. Meaning that this would have been a potential stumbling block. It would have been a potentially stumbling block for the Jews... Uh, in Paul's audience. Uh, they would have viewed Timothy as a covenant-breaking Jew, and they would not, they, they would not have even been uh, possibly welcomed in the synagogues as a result. So for Paul, it all has to do with the gospel and removing whatever hindrances, whatever hindrances that might keep that gospel from being heard by his audience. One commentator summarizes Paul's actions here in Acts 16 as, quote, salvation by grace living by love salvation by grace living acting by love it's prudence it's prudence in other words that paul applies and it doesn't comp compromise his message as we see in verses four and five they take the decision <clears throat> excuse me they take the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders uh, and the churches there in jerusalem in chapter 15 uh, and as a result, they share those with the churches that they go and visit, and they're strengthened, they're fortified in the faith. They continue to grow daily as a result. Now, when you hear that, don't, don't just read right past that. Don't let that simply be a summary statement of what was happening. It's an important insight. It's an important insight into how God uses the obedience of his people to accomplish his will, to accomplish his purpose. Paul and his team, they were obedient. They were obedient to keeping the gospel central and living that out, living out the implications of that gospel by love, by love, and the churches grew as a result. That's the Spirit's work in that. So it's a simple formula to follow, is it not? Salvation by grace, that's gospel, and living by love. That's the response. That's the response to receiving the good news. We see here how it pays dividends in the lives of those involved and the giving God all the glory, all the praise for what he's doing. So we've seen two ordinary human experiences, difficulty and discipleship, very interpersonal, very relational, and God is actively using those things to grow his church. Now let's look at the third one, the, the direction of the spirit, the direction of the spirit in the next section, verses six through 10. We see Paul, we see Silas, we see Timothy starting their missionary journey with prohibition. Prohibition. They are, for, they are forbidden by the spirit of going into Asia. Asia Minor, this was modern day Turkey. They attempted to go another route, but Luke says that the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go. Hmm. 
Now, what's going on here? Why is the Spirit forbidding them from going? After all, they have, they have the best intentions, do they not? They want, to, they want to preach the gospel, share the gospel, spread the gospel. Verses 9 and 10 tell us why. Look at verses 9 and 10. They tell us that there was a more urgent need in Macedonia. In Macedonia. We'll see that here in the next section. For that will take the team into Europe. And eventually, eventually that's going to be, that's going to be the bridgeway for Paul to stand before Caesar himself in Rome. That's what's going on. And what about those areas that they were forbidden from entering? By Acts 19, they're in Ephesus. They're in Turkey. So it's not a, it's not a permanent ban. It's simply temporary. There was something more pressing that the Spirit wanted his missionaries to do. The point being that the Spirit was directing them and they were following that direction. And that closed doors, closed doors provide just as much guidance as open doors do. Later, when Paul is writing about the role of the Spirit in the life of the believer, we read uh, earlier from Romans 8, Paul says this, If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit as well. And the image that Paul has in mind there is the image of soldiers marching together in formation down a straight line, in step with one another, following the orders of their CO. And that's the idea here, too. The missionaries are being led by the Spirit, following His every command, even, even the quote-unquote negative ones that we don't generally associate with the will of God and guidance from the Spirit. But the Spirit's chief job, church, is to glorify Jesus. Glorify Jesus so that His people might be conformed to His image. Now the team in verse 8, instead of going forward with their plans into Asia Minor to the north, they go south to Troas, where they essentially are waiting on the Spirit's next move. And it's here that Paul receives the vision of a man from Macedonia, urging them to come help. And verse 10 says that they immediately sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called them to preach the gospel there. So what we have here, friends, and this is, I, I'm, if you are taking notes, circling anything, this is, this is the dawning of the gospel ministry in Europe. That's what this is. This explains why they were forbidden from going initially into Asia Minor. God had bigger plans for them. His ambassadors are going right into the heart of the known world. They're going into Rome. They're going to Greece. The power, the prestige that those two empires represented at Paul's time. It's amazing. Now get this. You don't want to miss this. Paul, or Luke then mentions five cities. He mentions five cities over the next three chapters. These are the summary of Paul's missionary journey. Those five cities are Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. Each of these cities, each of these cities was well known and representative of the glory, the glory of the Greco-Roman Empire in the first century. Corinth, you know about Corinth? Corinth was a very sensual place. Pagan temples, sexual perversion everywhere. Athens, Athens, what was, what was significant about Athens? It, it, it represented the peak of the Greek Empire. And the renowned influence of the philosophers, right? Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all over the ancient world in the first century. Berea. Berea was a very affluent city where Roman dignitaries would retire to. Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. And Thessalonians were... They, they were, they were proud of their cultural influence surrounding the regions. It was a very cosmopolitan place where the worship of the Roman and the Egyptian pantheon was rampant. So idolatry everywhere. And then, of course, there's Philippi. Philippi that represented the glory of Rome's military might. You may recall that it was in Philippi. It was, it, it was in Philippi where... Uh, where Julius Caesar and Mark Antony defeated Brutus and Cassius in 42 BC. Excuse me, not Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. Augustus had made it a Roman colony as a result with all the privileges of Roman citizenship, including freedom from scourging and arrest. And Paul will take advantage of that later on in chapter 16, as a matter of fact. Philippi, though, was a miniature of Rome itself. 
with a strong military presence there, a rich political history, and the ever-present reminder there in Philippi that you were face-to-face -face with Roman power and the house of Caesar. Now, why do I tell you all that? I tell you all that because of what we're about to see. What we're about to see is the showdown, the showdown between two kingdoms. The most powerful kingdom that man had ever produced, the Roman Empire, and the kingdom of Almighty God. That's the showdown. Do you remember the vision from Daniel chapter 2? Do you remember that vision that King Nebuchadnezzar saw? He saw a statue, and a statue was made of bronze, made of gold, made of, made of uh, silver. And he saw, he saw this other, this single stone come and shatter that statue. And Daniel interprets that. He interprets that for King Nebuchadnezzar. And he's saying, this is the Babylonian Empire. This is the Assyrian Empire. This is the Greek Empire. This is the Roman Empire. And this little stone, this little stone that's going to destroy them all is the kingdom of Almighty God. Almighty God. And that is what we are about to witness start happening in Paul's second missionary journey. Now, friends, here's the thing. How does that little stone conquer this, you know, the statues, the kingdoms of this world? How does it do it? That's what's remarkable about this. It's not with an army. It's not the Crusades. It's not with coercion. It's not with diplomacy. It's not with compromise. It's with preaching. It's with baptism. It's with the Lord's Supper. It's with discipleship. And this small, this small missionary team will go into these five cities and they are going to proclaim the earth is going to shake. Prison doors are going to be flailed open. And there's going to be conversion, conversion, conversion. And as a result, what's going to happen to them in every single town they go into? They're going to be run out of town. They're going to be run out of town. That's the battle. That's the battle between the two kingdoms. And it all starts in Philippi. It all starts in Philippi. Now let me wrap this up. Just a few notes here on the conversion of Lydia. You'll, a note, a note that you can miss if you just read the Bible, uh, or if you just read the text without understanding the background of it. Why does it say that Paul went outside the city to find the place of prayer? Why does it say that? You know why it says that? Because the city was so pagan, so Roman, that Jews were not allowed inside the city. Synagogues were not allowed inside the city. The, the, inside the city was only for Roman citizens. Only for Roman citizens. So they go outside on the Sabbath to see if there's any Jews there. Uh, and they come across uh, this group of women and they begin talking with them. And one of them, Lydia, who's from Thyatira, Thyatira, that, which is one of the cities that's addressed by Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. She begins listening, and verse 14 tells us, Luke makes the note, that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And she and her household were baptized. Baptized. There is the direct means that God uses to build his church. His word, his sacraments, covenant signs for her and her entire household. Her entire household. This is echoing, this is following the model throughout Redemptive history, the Bible, starting with Noah, given to Abraham, seen in the Passover and Exodus under Moses, reaffirmed with Joshua in the promised land. And it, it continues with Jesus and the apostles. Word, sacrament, God's direct means by which he opens hearts, opens hearts that would otherwise be closed to his kingdom. That's how God does it. So how is your heart this morning? How is your heart this morning? How are you approaching conflict? Are you open? Are you open to God working in your heart and life? Not just in the things that are easy, but in the things that are really difficult, really hard. God grows. He grows his church through difficulties, through discipleship, through direction, and through direct means. I want to end by reading you that last section in Daniel chapter 2. Here's what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar about that small stone that he saw. 
And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Forever. Amen? Amen. The gospel of the kingdom given to you this morning. You are invited to call and receive and respond to that. Let's pray now. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity now to come and partake in the Lord's Supper. We pray that what we have heard with our ears, Lord, now we get to uh, receive uh, the bread and the wine of our Lord Jesus. We thank you for this covenant meal, and we pray that you would use it to bless, to edify, to grow your people through these direct means. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. First Sunday of the month, we do come to the Lord's table, the Lord's table that he has prepared for us. So again, direct means, direct means by which God would grow his church, grow his people. And so if you're here and you're a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we invite you to partake in the Lord's Supper. The officers will serve you the elements, and then if you'll just please wait as a, until everyone is served, and then we will eat together. We will drink together. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he then took the cup, and he said, This cup is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat and we drink, brothers and sisters, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And when we have the Lord's Supper, you are given, uh, you are given two uh, inserts in your bulletin. One is to prepare you for the Lord's Supper, and uh, that was given last week. You're given another one today to reflect upon why are we doing this, what's the significance of it, so we don't fall into just the routine of taking the Lord's Supper, but remembering again, wow, this is, this is one of the direct means that God has given to us to encourage his people, to comfort his people, to speak to his people through the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus. So I invite you to reflect upon that as the elements are being uh, passed around, being served. And then also we have, uh, uh, we have uh, this insert here that has the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed. I'll, I'm, I'm going to read the Ten Commandments, and then we're going to confess the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to remind you as well that this month we do have gluten-free options right here in the middle of the, uh, of the plates, if that's something that you need as well. But here again, God's word, God speaking to us through his word. The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. Before we say the Apostles' Creed together, just one word of warning, fencing the table as well. Uh, as I said, the table is for all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus for their salvation, who are united to Christ by faith, faith alone, uh, baptized into the triune name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if you're here and you're not a believer, then we politely but firmly ask you not to participate in the Lord's Supper. It is not my word, it is not the word of Covenant Presbyterian Church, but the word of the Apostle Paul speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle warns that if we come and we do this in a flippant manner, if we do this not being able to discern, understand really what's going on here, the broken body, the shed blood, the substitutionary nature of the atonement for, for you, then we are eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves, and we don't want that for anyone here. If you're here and you're not a believer, today the response for you is to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the response. Give your life to the Lord Jesus. Call upon him uh, as we see in the book of Acts and uh, ask him to forgive you of your sins, to make, you, or to make him your very own. Uh, and then let us know. Let us know if you have made that decision, if you have, if you have called upon of the Lord. We would love to know that so we can pray for you, we can encourage you, and we can walk alongside you, just like we saw in the book of Acts as well, discipling you, growing you in the faith as well. 
the Apostles' Creed. Let's say this together, I'll pray, and then we will serve the elements. Christian, what do you believe about Almighty God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray, then we will eat and drink. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you have given us these ordinary means, Lord, to speak directly to your people, to minister directly to your people, and to grow. Grow, sanctify your people, grow your church. We pray that you would do that now as we come to partake. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The officers will please come forward. Thank you. for you. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us your very life. Uh, Lord, that you did not hold back even your own uh, livelihood, your own obedience on our behalf. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you were willing to die in our place for our sins. We give you the praise. Help us to live in light of that incredible gift. And we pray it all in your name. Amen.
blood of Christ, brothers and sisters, shed for the forgiveness of sins, drink this in remembrance of him. Let's pray, then we'll sing our concluding hymn, and we'll conclude our service. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've given to us, Lord. Thank you for the fact that you were willing to even shed your very own blood. Lord, that our sin might be atoned for, might be paid in full, that we might be forgiven, and that we might be given new lives, new identities as your people. Help us to live in light of this, Lord. Help us to improve upon these, the, the sacrament this week, Lord, improving upon receiving the broken body and the shed blood, that we might use it to put sin to death in our lives, that we might use it, uh, Lord, to have a redemptive view on the world, redemptive view of conflict, redemptive view of difficulties that we uh, undoubtedly will face this week, Lord. Help us to do so, we pray, by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you'll please stand, we're going to conclude our service now. Conclude our service by singing. Christ has made the sure foundation. Hymn 402 in your hymnals. If you'll please stand and we'll conclude our service with this wonderful hymn. so much for your participation in the Lord's service. He sends you out with his blessing now from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Lift out your hands, people, symbolically receiving Christ's blessing upon you. Now may, God, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You are dismissed.
We'll start Sunday school in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much.